If I can have your attention, uh, I'd like to welcome you to the uh, plenary uh, speaker uh, this evening. I have been asked to say to begin with that um, you know what I'm going to say, actually. There's going to be a reception <laughs> um, after the talk tonight. Um, and uh, the, the other thing I am charged with doing is introducing our speaker, Jonathan Israel. Um, and I know that, that every one of you knows something about Jonathan Israel's work on the Enlightenment. Some of you may not know, as I didn't really know, until I began to, to do a little web search in, in preparation for this introduction, um, the real sort of uh, geographical and topical scope of the work that Jonathan Israel has done. So I, I just want to try to give you a sense of that. Um, he started out writing about Central America and Mexico and writing about issues of race and class um, in, uh, in colonial Mexico. And then he's also worked on, uh, well, a significant portion of Europe, Italy, Spain, the Dutch Republic, Great Britain, the Low Countries, Scandinavia, and Russia. There have been, it seems to me, uh, two foci of uh, Jonathan Israel's interest. One on the Dutch Republic, and he's written a number of books on various aspects of the Dutch monarchy, the cultural, the political, the military, the other kinds of uh, movements uh, that uh, were instigated by the Dutch with respect to various other parts of Europe. Um, and I'll just mention, because Marlene Rosamond told me that there is a book of Jonathan Israel's on the history of the Dutch Republic, which is especially important in present-day Netherlands. It's the book, The Dutch Republic, Its Rise, Greatness and Fall, 1477 to 1806. And Rosamond tells me that this tells the story of what everybody in the Netherlands knows nowadays is a very important uh, period in Dutch history and in the history of Europe, but in a way that fills in many, many details and provides narrative that uh, were not known to people generally. And it's been widely read and, uh, and very, uh, very much admired and very much appreciated, uh, apparently, in, in, in the, in the present-day Netherlands. Um, so there's, there's a, a, a very large scholarly audience, but also a more general audience for uh, Jonathan Israel's work. Um, and I suspect this is true also of the second focus of his work, which is jewelry in early modern Europe. And there have been, um, well, two books really devoted to topics having to do with the Jewish community, one having to do with the Jews in the mercantile system, and I think that one is centered in the, the Dutch Republic. And then another, the, the title of which is Diasporas Within Diaspora, uh, which having to do with various uh, divisions and dispersions within the Jewish community in the early modern period. So that's, that's sort of the second focus. I think that the, I guess this could be called a third focus, that's um, known to, to everyone here has to do with uh, the work that Jonathan Israel has done on the Enlightenment. Um, and um, it's been particularly provocative uh, because of its immense erudition and because of its very original claims uh, and the sort of uh, controversies and uh, 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 pe uh, people it's persuaded and people it hasn't persuaded and the debate that, that's developed uh, from that. Two volumes of that, um, I'll just remind you of the names of them. Uh, well, I thought I would. Um, <laughs> I can't. So I probably can't produce the following. Radi radical Enlightenment, uh, which has to do with the, the uh, philosophy and the beginnings of mo modernity. And uh, the other one is um, uh, philosophy controverted. Enlightenment. Enlightenment controverted. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Contested, yes, thank you. Um, which has to do with the claim that there are different enlightenments and to some extent working against each other and to some extent working uh, uh, together uh, for the same goals. Um, 
There's a third volume, which Jonathan just told me is now in the publisher's hands, though it's not expected to appear for a while, and uh, the title of which is not yet decided. Um, so I think that, that this is what has been most influential and important for us. Um, and I think aside from particular theses that have been argued uh, by Jonathan, what is so exciting and important is the extent to which his work takes philosophy seriously as, as a, a dynamic force within the development of Europe. Of philosophical ideas are presented by Jonathan as arising out of very concrete situations and having very concrete consequences. And uh, what I like about this is that it fills in some historical context for what I always feel when I read early modern texts. There's a kind of urgency in the way in which the early modern figures are doing philosophy. Um, they, the, the issues have a kind of direct significance for them, which you can tell just from the text, but you can see how this is playing out uh, across a long period of time and in many aspects of, of culture in, in Jonathan's work. So I think that's very much appreciated. Um, I thought I would try to find some way to lighten up um, an introduction of such a scholarly and renowned figure. And I got, came up with a kind of weak idea that I would Google, <laughs> and I would look at Amazon.com and look at some of the reviews <laughs> written by, uh, <laughs> who knows who they are written by. Um, and some of them, uh, obviously, academics or, or could be academics if they wanted to be, but others from you know, less intellectual sources, and I thought those were the most interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so. They were uh, actually universally, so far as I could tell, admiring. So I didn't get that kind of material. But it was kind of interesting, uh, the, the basis on which, or the way in which their admiration was expressed. So uh, here's a little bit of a sample. Uh, this was inevitable. Somebody talked about the extent to which the debate had been uh, discussed in exhaustive detail and then dash, and to me, exhausting. <laughs> and uh, another does note, I think, with a note of warning, that there are long passages in Latin, German, French, and Dutch that have not been translated. And I think all of these were, you know, kind of, in a way, admiring warnings. But I'm sure that the following <laughs> remark was admiring. Uh, it said that in one of the recent books on, on the Enlightenment, the bibliography is 180 pages of fine print. <laughs> so with that warning about what you're in for, <laughs> I'd like to introduce Jonathan Israel, whose topic is Leibniz's Theodicy as a Critique of Spinoza and Bale and Blueprint for the Philosophy Wars of the 18th Century. Thank you very much for that uh, very generous uh, introduction, too generous probably. I'd like to begin, as uh, so many of the speakers have, with uh, thanking uh, Sam Newlands and, and the organizers for uh, enabling me to be part of what is really a very remarkable occasion. So much uh, expertise on, on Leibniz, it's, it's terribly impressive and it's marvelous to be part of it, not that I can share in, in that expertise, as will rapidly become evident to you. But perhaps I can add something, uh, a little at least, to the uh, historical context of uh, the debates that we've been having over the last couple of days, and we'll continue with tomorrow. As a celebration of natural theology, Leibniz's theodicy may truly be said to figure amongst the noblest, most uplifting philosophical works of the 18th century. The great majority of 17th and 18th century philosophers and enlighteners spoke of the basic harmony of faith and reason, of philosophy and theology, but no other philosopher collated the basic assumptions and beliefs of the age with such power and beauty of ideas. 
If we consider for the moment the passage at the beginning of the theodicy where Leibniz first introduces his conception of Christianity's role in the world and of Jesus as the supreme spokesman of natural theology, it is striking that Leibniz stresses the following feature. Moses, he says, established the belief in one God, source of all good, author of all things. The chief point where Judaism failed to establish natural theology in all its splendor was in only implying, instead of fully asserting, the doctrine of the immortality of souls. It was Jesus Christ who demonstrated, I'm quoting, demonstrated fully the results of accepting immortality of souls, proclaiming that divine goodness and justice are revealed to perfection in God's designs for the souls of men. The only distinction of the Christian religion he brings into the discussion, remarkably, laying aside all the rest in, in, in the theodicy, is that Jesus alone, quoting again, brought about the conversion of natural religion into law and gained for it the authority of a public dogma. Christianity was not unique in propagating knowledge of natural religion. Later, quoting again, uh, also, Muhammad showed no divergence from the great dogmas of natural theology. His followers spread them abroad, even among the most remote races of Asia and Africa, whither Christianity had not been carried, abolishing many superstitions contrary to the true doctrine of the unity of God and the immortality of souls. Why was Jesus completing Moses' work by introducing immortality of souls so crucially important, because by doing so, he made men happy by anticipation and gave them here on earth a foretaste of future happiness. What do we know of our souls? These, Leibniz says, reflect the perfections of God, order, as was quoted already earlier today, proportions, ha the harmony, delight us, paintings and music are samples of these. God is all order. He always keeps truth of proportions. He makes universal harmony, all beauty is an effusion of his rays. But the opening pages of the theodicy are as much a critique as a celebration of contemporary religion has long been obvious enough and may well have struck contemporaries even harder than it does us. Most of those basing their lives on religion or arranging them partly by religion mean by religion, says Leibniz, either obeying ceremonies or asserting points of faith. When they do this without insight and without a true grasp of natural theology and the moral values of, that natural theology inculcates, as most people do, they inflict more harm than good. He strongly implies that most theologians and most men of religion in his day did in fact inflict great damage precisely because they were unenlightened and instead of grasping the true meaning of pursuing the common good, think only of ceremonies and dogmas instead of the oneness of natural theology. <coughs> theologians need to be more aware of the closeness of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam to each other, and Christianity's status as the culmination of natural theology. Because most people, instead of understanding things properly, express their devotion through overstressing ceremonies, they are dangerous, both to other individuals and to society. Dangerous by aggravating theological splits that are really irrelevant and morally insignificant and infecting our conception of God. It is a serious matter and something always and everywhere damaging to venerate a God who is unworthy of being venerated. And broadly speaking, this is what religious people generally do with their dogmatism, ceremonies, and points of faith, says Leibniz. But what I chiefly want to emphasize in this paper is not Leibniz's role as the uh, supreme spokesman, I think one could fairly say, for natural theology, or as the great, uh, phil the supreme philosophical harmonizer of Protestantism with Catholicism, and Judaism with Christianity, and Islam with the other monotheistic faiths, but rather the overriding relevance and practicality in early Enlightenment terms of his the theodicy project for uh, Protestants, Catholics, Jews, Muslims, and deists alike. For in these opening pages of the Theodicy, 
Uh, Leibniz not only offers a philosophical critique of defective, disfigured religion, an overwhelming cultural and social reality 